Hi. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about how to assess young children. So I know some of you are thinking, wow, I'm going to teach secondary school. How does this apply to me? And I think it is important to, this is an interesting case study to think about assessment in the case of young children because we're really thinking about um, a case in where there's developmental reasons why children can't do certain tasks and I think it's important to consider and also all of us or well, most of us will have children at some point right um, we're also and um, we'll be in the presence of young children and you never know where your life will take you so um, I think this is an interesting case study and also um, to consider what assessment of young children will look like so let's consider um, some of the issues in assessing young children um, so why do we need to assess young children? And so, I mean, that's a legitimate question, right? Like, why can't we just let them play? And really what we'll find is that assessment through play is a great way to assess young children. But, but why do we need to do this, right? Um, it helps promote learning and development. So we want to know, are they learning and developing? To identify them for health and social services. So when we have, when we have children who are not developing um, in a typical fashion, we want to make sure that we're getting them those health and support services that they need. Um, and then we also want to say, is the program we've developed for young children is, um, working and improving, and we want to be able to evaluate the types of work that we're doing with young children. And the two hold those schools accountable. Um, in Florida, we have the um, Voluntary Pre-K program, VPK. You've probably seen the signs around school, even if you're around town, even if you're not familiar with what VPK means. So Florida is unique among the states in that we have a program that provides um, universal pre-kindergarten for students, um, but rather than have that provided through the public school system, it's through a voucher system. So what happens is if you have a child the year before they would enter kindergarten, so when they're four, you can um, send them to VPK to a variety of um, anywhere that has um, that's been licensed by the state to provide care services through, through, v, through VK, VPK programs and when you enroll your child the um, center themselves gets a voucher from the state to provide that care so it's a, like a privatization of that pre-k program and so there's some advantages and disadvantages and as you can imagine the level and the quality of that care can vary greatly depending on where the child is receiving that VBK instruction. Um, and it would be really interesting to see kind of um, the outcomes of this and if it's, um, but I do believe it's been a benefit. Um, across the country, for a long time, we've had Head Start programs, which were meant to help students from, or children from low income, um, backgrounds and students from poverty to have um, pre-k experiences prior to coming to school to help them with literacy language and math skills and um, to give them that jump start at school that more that their more affluent peers um, have and what we do know about head start is that it does provide a huge benefit for students who participate and that those changes last and persist through elementary school and even through high school okay so what are some concerns about testing young children um, one is that the test is too narrow, and so, and specifically, that when we're assessing kids on things like um, literacy, um, alphabet knowledge, number, numeracy numbers, that then that narrows the curriculum so that, like, for example, in Head Start programs, now we're focused so heavily on those numeracy and literacy skills that perhaps we're missing other really important things to be taught in those VPK programs, things like um, sharing and social skills and, and play and exploration and um, sense of self and social skills that might be even like the core of what we might have traditionally considered a good preschool um, program. Um, that it can shift resources because tests cost money and so if we're spending money on testing the more maybe we're not spending them on the types of materials we need in classrooms like books and play materials and and high quality teachers um, and and the teachers time because when we're assessing young children we typically have to do that one-on-one -on -one. we you know can't give you know a bunch of scantron sheets to you know four-year-olds because that you know won't work um, and so that time that the teacher is spending assessing students one-on-one, -on -one, that's time that the teacher is not spending um, providing instruction or um, guidance or um, lessons to that child, right? Um, and that lots of times these tests are used in a punitive way rather than a way to strengthen programs. And we could say this for a lot of the testing that's happening in schools, that we're using it to punish rather than to strengthen. 
And then finally, the biggest concern when we're testing young children is that are they developmentally appropriate? Is this test going to assess students in a way that makes sense for their age and their development level, right? So some really basic things, things like, well, we're not going to ask, you know, three-year-olds to read because, you know, three-year-olds can't read, um, or, you know, bubble and answer choices, but then thinking about what's the attention span of a child, what's going to be engaging to them, can we use bright colors? Can we ask them to be involved? What kinds of manipulative or things can we ask them to do, right? Those are the kinds of things we're asking. We're thinking about developmentally appropriate activities, instruction, assessments. So how should we assess young children and infants? Um, we should use multiple sources of information. You know how we talked, um, if you've ever, ever worked with a toddler, you know that they're highly variable, right? The way that they act one minute to the next um, varies greatly. So we wanna have lots of sources of information and not just rely on one moment in time, but over time. Um, they should benefit the child and improve learning. So um, particularly because assessments of this age can be somewhat traumatic that we're interrupting their life. We want to make sure that there's a direct benefit to the child, but this is actually a key for all assessments. We only want to assess someone if it provides a benefit to that person. And I think that we could argue that some of the state accountability assessments aren't providing direct benefits to the children that we're assessing um, in a K through 12 setting as well. And they should involve the family, and this is key. When we're assessing children, um, because that home environment is key to their sense of self and their development, we need to involve that family. Um, when we take a child away from the family to assess them, then um, we're not going to get an accurate result because there's going to be a separation and anxiety. So when possible, as much as possible, we want the family to stay in the room. We wanna ask the parents and the caregivers, the teachers perhaps, what the child's able to do at home and rely upon those assessments, rely upon that information when thinking about the development level of the child. Just because the child can't do it right then in the room or is not responding, um, if the parent is indicating that that child does that at home, we should probably rely on that source of information unless we have a reason not to. The assessment should be fair to all children. Again, this is, an, this is a, a quality that we would want across all assessments and then really thinking about how the cultural differences among families, especially since young children um, spend more time with families and have less exposure to the outside world, um, that how that might impact the fairness of an assessment. Again, developmentally appropriate, we talked a lot about that, thinking about motor control, attention span, separation anxiety, um, environmental factors. Um, obviously, they can't read and write, the fear of strangers, the attention span, inconsistency of behaviors, all of these things and go into a developmentally appropriate activities. Also, comprehension of directions and the level of vocabulary that's required of that assessment. We're thinking about we might need to demonstrate what's required rather than just telling a child what needs to be done. Um, there's some really standardized ways to measure tests. We already looked at the PVVT at the beginning of the year. Remember that was the test with the vocabulary and the EVT is that kind of the opposite where we solicit words. Um, the Bracken and the Bailey, and this is this is a picture of the Bailey, is a measure of developmental scales. And um, the EL, ECLSB study, and this is a database that I use actually quite often, it was a study of um, a re nationally representative sample of children born in the year 2002. Um, and it looked, it tracked children from birth, then again at nine months, at 12 months, then at two years, and then the year before kindergarten, and then at kindergarten. Um, and it gave us developmental scales, it interviewed parents and teachers at each of those times, it gave us health information, so, um, social interactions. Um, and achievement levels, health. So it's this rich database of information. They use many of these kind of standardized measures. So we have some really amazing kind of really cool data about that. Okay, so here's an example of the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. Remember, it's receptive vocabulary. So do they know words? Can they point to the picture of laughing? But think about how this might be culturally biased, right? So if I, if in my family we don't use the word laughing, we use the word chuckling instead, the student might not know the word laughing and might indicate that they have a lower level of vocabulary than they actually do because we might use more idiomatic phrases. 
the um, expressive vocabulary test, I would say, what is this? And hopefully they would say a word like dog or puppy or golden retriever, right? Those would all be acceptable answers, right? Um, this is the Bailey's, and you can kind of see here's some sample items. Um, this is the mental scale, the cognitive scale. Um, so at 12 months, we'd want them to be able to build a tower, turn the pages of a book. The motor scale at 12 months would be able to walk, to grab a pencil in the middle. Um, so you can kind of see there's also a, um, a social scale, a, a speech language development scale. So you can kind of see different ways in which we might um, evaluate the development. And Bailey is, the Bailey scale is really about the development of the child. And it might be a way in which we would, we would see if a child was behind in these areas um, to identify them for special support. Remember we talked about special education and developmental delays. The Bailey is one way that we could identify students for those kinds of help and support. Um, we can also assess them in the classroom through um, observations and informal protocols and then VPK. So we'll look at some of these. So here's an example of a checklist that I might use in a, in a VPK classroom. Um, so I could see, you know, um, for motor skills, can they fit small items together? Can they hold a pencil correctly? Can they use scissors? Can they print their first name? And I could say they are beginning to do this, they're developing this, they're proficient. And some of these, maybe I didn't address or assess at this time. So maybe in December, we haven't talked about printing first names yet. So we, I might not, I might put an NA there, right? So this is an example of a checklist. And these are the kinds of things that, that throughout that December time period, I might be each student just kind of seeing if they can do all of these things. Um, I could do teacher designed assessments, things like asking students to draw to draw a circle or to stack blocks or the types of <coughs> of short assessments. Again, I usually have to do these one on one at this age level because they're not independent yet and they need me to record what they've done. Um, there's also developmental checklists. Um, so I don't know how many of you are parents and you know out there in the cyberspace here, but ages and stages, um, oftentimes when you go to the pediatrician's office with a child, they give you kind of a checklist depending on the, the age of your child and saying, can your child do these things? And these are kind of warning signs, a baseline of if, you're, if your child at this age isn't doing these things yet, then we're gonna be really worried. And we know that development is a huge range. So these are usually things that, um, most of the time would be most children should have done for months. Um, so here's an example. This is a 16 month um, checklist. And then um, does your child point to um, pat or pick up picture, try to pick up pictures in a book? So it's 16 months. That's um, over a year old. If your child's not pointing to pictures in a book, we would be really worried as a parent and the doctor would be worried. And this is where the doctor might be intervened and, and um, and look for um, maybe ask more questions of the parent and this might be where they might refer them to some additional services. Okay, um, and then we can have some sort of portfolios. We talked a lot about portfolios a few weeks ago, but um, where we having collections and, and early childhood teachers use portfolios in a really different way. They might use more pictures of what kids have created, maybe taking a picture of the blocks that the kids built, right? Or pictures of the child playing or demonstrating a skill. Um, there might be rubrics and rating scales or writing down narratives of what the child said to record the development of that child. So again, um, if you're in class activity today, I would just like you to think about what's the design and assessment to determine if a four-year-old's ready for kindergarten. And obviously one aspect of that getting ready for kindergarten, try to think of some developmentally appropriate activities. Again, if you're having trouble with this task, um, feel free to email me, contact me through, um, we can talk on the phone, you can meet in my office, I'd be happy to help talk you through um, what a developmentally appropriate assessment would be um, when we're assessing young children. Anyway, I look forward to looking at all your projects this week and um, I'll talk to you later. Bye.